Here in this video, we are going to be going over all of your economic data this week, my expectations for it, and how this could affect the markets. Towards the end of this video, we will also share my thoughts on Tesla for this week. And trust me, you do not want to miss it. So first up, let's start with the economic data for this week. On Monday, we have consumer inflation expectations. Not expecting that will be a, a, a big mover at all. And then the monthly budget statement. Again, I don't think that's going to be a big driving factor of markets. And that's it for Monday. So Monday could be a pretty slow day. Tuesday, you have PPI month over month. We are expecting 0.1%. Last month was 0.2% for your headline PPI number. That's going to be the first piece of bigger data that we have this week. But as I have mentioned before here on this channel, I don't think inflation or the Fed really matters to markets right now. Unless we get, um, you know, hotter than expected data. I mean, I think the markets are, are pretty comfortable with the fact that inflation is falling. OK, I don't think it's going to be a big surprise that inflation does fall. And in fact, if inflation starts to fall more than expected, that's actually a bad sign for the economy. Because the last thing you want is deflation. Deflation's worse than inflation. And then you're really looking at a severe recession. So in a way, you don't want to see deflation. Like you want to see the in inflation just stay around where it has been. Okay, so PPI can be important. Um, but I don't think it's going to be a big market driving catalyst of this week. You have Fed Bostic that speaks at 1.15 um, Tuesday as well. That is Eastern Standard Time. Now, on Wednesday, you're going to get CPI. Now, again, as long as CPI core month over month does not come in hotter than expected, I think it's going to be a, a, a small reaction to markets, okay? We are expecting 0.2%. The forecast is 0.3% month over month. So if we come in hotter than expected, that's going to be a negative, right? But lower than expected or in line with expectations, I'm not expecting that is going to give the markets um, much of an upside reaction. That's just my personal opinion. I think it's all about the economic data at this point, as long as inflation does not come in hotter than expected. Core month or core year over year is expected at about 3.2%. Last month, we were 3.3%. So a little bit of a down move there. Headline inflation month over month is expected to go from negative 0.1% to positive 0.2%. And year over year inflation is expected um, to fall from 3% to 2.9%. So those are your expectations. Let me know what you think um, we could actually see for inflation uh, coming Wednesday. You have seen container freight shipping prices really starting to rise recently, and that has some people concerned about the reflation that we could see, although I don't think that is very likely at this point. I, I, I do think consumers are revolting against higher prices. By far the most important day for this upcoming week is going to be Thursday, August 15th in my personal opinion. You will get retail sales month over month. Um last month you came in at 0%. We are expecting positive 0.3%. If that's the kind of number we get, I expect markets will be very happy on that news. If we get a negative number or uh, another let's call it 0.1 or 0% number, just, just a, a lower than expected number. I don't think it's going to be that big of a problem. But if you get a negative number, yeah, that's going to be a, a, a big problem. Okay. But just barely missing estimates coming in a little bit lower. I think the markets can actually um, still rally on that because again, the markets are going to start to form this mentality of it could have been worse. It could have been worse. It could have been worse. And uh, um, that's what I think could start this week. Uh, so retail sales is the most important data point of this week, in my personal opinion, which any other normal time, it's always been CPI. But I think um, markets are more focused on the economy now than inflation. You will get export prices and import prices month over month, as well as your export prices 
um, and import prices year over year. And this will move the estimates for the Atlanta Fed GDP um, now tracker, which is currently sitting at about 2.9% for Q3 GDP. Uh, the average um, economist estimate is about 1.8% uh, Q3 GDP. So those numbers will move the needle for your GDP estimates. You will also get other things, um, inventories, uh, industrial production, manufacturing production, and business inventories that will also move those GDP estimates. But beyond retail sales, initial jobless claims is probably going to be the next most important catalyst. Um, all of this data comes out at 8.30 in the morning Eastern Standard Time, by the way, on Thursday. We are expecting 232,000 initial jobless claims for the week of August 10th. Last week, we came in at 233,000 initial jobless claims, and that was actually the catalyst that gave us the best green day, the, the, the highest gain in a year for the S&P 500, was coming in 7,000 lower than expected for initial jobless claims. So I think that's still gonna be important. Now, New York Empire State Manufacturing Index, expecting that to be roughly the same as last month, around negative six. Philadelphia Fed Manufacturing Index came in at, or is expected to come in at seven, so a little bit worse. And retail sales, excluding autos month over month, is expected to come in at 0.1%. That's another important one that Wall Street will pay attention to, specifically in regards to retail sales. Uh, you will get Philly Fed business conditions, Philly Fed CapEx index, Philly Fed employment, Philly Fed new orders, and Philly Fed prices paid. Prices paid is going to be the most important metric of that um, report. So we will see how that goes. Fed Mussolini does speech, uh, does does speak at uh, 9, 10 in the morning as well, but not expecting much out of that. So that is really your uh, major catalyst for Thursday. You also have Fed Harker that speaks at about 1 p.m. as well. And I think Thursday's gonna give us the next maybe 2% move um, for markets, depending how the data goes. On Friday, we will get building permits that come out at 8.30 in the morning. I don't think this is much of a catalyst at all. Um, it's It's been a catalyst because if you get more building permits, that's more building, that's more housing, that's less housing inflation. Again, I think inflation at this point is not as big of a problem from the market's perspective as the economy. So I don't think that will move things at all, really. Let's just be honest. But Michigan consumer sentiment will be important. That comes out at 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday. We are expecting a headline number of 66.7, which would be a little bit of an improvement from last month. Five-year inflation expectations are expected to stay the same at 3%. Michigan consumer expectations are expected to fall from 68.8 to 68.2. And Michigan current conditions are expected to fall as well from 62.7 down to 62.3. Inflation expectations for the one-year period ahead are expected to come in line with what you've seen last month as well at about 2.9%. So it's actually interesting that you're expecting the headline number on the survey to go up, but you're actually expecting consumer expectations and current conditions to fall a little bit from last month. That might just be an error in the way that we're seeing the data because I don't think that's possible. The headline number could go up if these other two components are expected to go down. So really, long story short, Thursday is your important day for markets. That is going to be the day in which um, is really going to guide investor sentiment going ahead until we get larger economic data, which retail sales, I mean, the consumer spending money is like 70% of the economy. So that's a main focus of investors this upcoming week. And as far as earnings for this upcoming week, you have a lot of just random companies um, reporting on Monday. On Tuesday, you have Home Depot um, pre-market. I think that can be important. Again, not necessarily a company people need to go to. It's it's more of a luxury company that 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 people go to, uh, you know, fix up their homes to to, you know. DIY projects, right? So Home Depot can be very important. You have New Bank, 
um, Tuesday and after hours, but that's it. You have Dole and some other companies like UBS that report Wednesday pre-market. Wednesday and after hours, you have Cisco. Um, that's probably going to be the biggest one. Um, one of the bigger ones of this week. Thursday pre-market, you have Alibaba, you have Walmart. That's a very important company. Walmart back during 2007 or so was one of the first kind of signs we had of a broader, a broader slowdown in the consumer. What, I, what Walmart has to say will be very important. I will be paying very close attention to what Walmart has to say because I think they are probably the best company out there um, to, to give us information on the economy and on the consumer. If Walmart says the consumer is doing just fine, people are spending money, then that will alleviate uh, quite a bit of, of, of my concerns. If Walmart has negative things to say about the consumer, if they expect the consumer is going to slow down even more, then I will really... Um, take that as more or less um, hard data, if you will. It's something Wall Street may not pay too much attention to, but it is absolutely the most important company um, in, in regards to kind of evaluating the consumer. So that'll be important. JD.com, John Deere, um, Grab, and some other companies. Thursday and after hours, applied materials could be important for the semiconductors. And on Friday, you have Flower Foods and you know a couple other smaller companies there. So this week's earnings lineup, it's not any important companies that will, broadly speaking, move the markets, but Home Depot, Walmart, we need to see them say good things about the consumer. Um, I don't know if Wall Street will pick up on any negative things said about the consumer in conference calls or whatnot. I don't know if the markets will broadly react to that, but it's something I will pay very close attention to. Before we go any further throughout this video, I do want to share this clip with you. Um, it's from Renaissance uh, Dada. He, he has become a, a big face of the investing community um, in recent months. Uh, you'll also see Josh Brown in this clip as well. But he says, I have no confidence the unemployment rate will stay where it is. And I think this is very valuable context that you need to know if you're investing in markets today. It's next move front and center as investors brace for a week of pivotal economic data. Joining us on set for his take is Neil Dutta, partner and head of economic research at Renaissance Macro Research. So, Neil, they said it. Tom Lee saying the Fed needs to be less data dependent. Jeremy Siegel thinks the market knows better and uh, should be listened to. Uh, but uh, he did backtrack on those comments slightly later. But I mean, where do you stand on where the economy is? What is demanding of the Fed right now? Uh, I think the Fed needs to get on with uh, cutting interest rates. I think they should do a large upfront move. Um, if you look at their economic projections for 2025, Mike, they have the unemployment rate at 4.2 percent and they have core inflation at 2.3 percent. And then they have the Fed funds rate at 4.1 percent. We're at 4.3 percent unemployment. Core inflation has been doing that at 2.3 for the last three months. And the Fed funds rates at five and a half percent. So I think it's sort of like which of these is not like the other. And you were saying this in advance of yeah. some of the July data. I want to also make clear. So you're not saying because of what happened in markets over a few days. No, I think the markets are a sideshow. I mean, why did the market sell off in the first place? I know people want to talk about the yen carry yeah. trade, but the, the, the big sell off in the markets happened in the two days after the Fed met because the data was really weak. And we have a lot of data coming out next week. And if that's weak, I would anticipate, uh, uh, you know, uh, some pressure. Do you agree with what Professor Siegel is saying? Conceptually, the Fed needs to start making forecasts because there's a long line of people who would say, OK, maybe forecasts might be uh, superior to data dependent, but how good are the Fed's forecasts? Not a great track record. No, I agree with that. I mean, I think this isn't about forecasting. This is about just adjusting the policy rate to what we've already seen happen. You know, the unemployment rate is up. It's been rising for five of the last six months. And core inflation has been coming in below expected for the last two months. And what's the Fed doing? Oh, we have time. You know, we can wait. We just need a little bit more data. I mean, to me, it's a little bit ridiculous. So I do think they're kind of like holding on to this higher for longer, a bit past the expiration date. The counter to that, as you know, is, well, the unemployment rate is up because labor supply is up. The layoffs are not that worrisome. 
Uh, and so there's sort of a cushion, maybe s- structurally tightness in the labor market. You you know what I'm getting at. Yeah, even, I mean, even people say, hey, construction employment is actually up, and that's always been a better recession. Immigration has resumed yeah. is another thing that you I hearing. think it's sort of like like a little bit too much like PhD think. I mean, I look at the unemployment rate historically. It's a line that's either going up or down. It doesn't move sideways. If it's moving sideways for an extended period of time, it's because usually the Fed does something. Right. So and then if you think about the outlook, like what about the outlook gives anybody confidence that the unemployment will just stabilize here on its own? I mean, housing is slowing. If you look at new home sales that haven't been started, that's down over 35 percent against last year. That's going to weigh on construction. You're not going to get the kind of inventory investment boom that you saw in Q2. Uh, And incomes are slowing, which is going to weigh on consumer spending. So. Yeah, I don't have any confidence that the unemployment rate will just stay where it is. Looking at layoffs, I mean, you're, you're going to be waiting too long because that's usually the last thing to happen. What do you think they're going to do at uh, Jackson Hole in terms of rhetoric and messaging? What, what's your, where are you placing your bets? Uh, I think that they're going to basically do a little bit of a victory lap and say that the inflation issue has been resolved. And I think that, you know, that the balance of risks have changed and that'll set them up to cut. And that's code for it. Yeah, yeah. we're going to try to, to get moving. Um, you know, Part of the big bullish case for risk assets, if you go back to the highs in July, I was saying this too, was was the certainty that we were on a path for a soft landing and that the Fed was going to ease, but it was going to be able to do it deliberately for the right reasons because inflation was coming down and slower easing cycles historically are more bullish for stocks than rapid ones when the Fed is kind of rushing uh, to rescue the economy. Do you think they have room to sort of take it slow if they start in September? Uh, I don't think that they should take it slow. No. It's, it's not about what, I mean, like I get the signaling, like I've seen people say, well, if they go only 25, that's bullish. And if they go 50, yeah. it's bearish. But it's, it's really about the economic data. I mean, they're very, very restrictive. In my mind, by their own admission. So in my mind, that actually lowers the threshold for them to do a big upfront yeah. move. Because even after 50 basis points, you'd still be actually quite tight. There's a political consideration. Donald Trump gave a press conference yesterday. And uh, one of the things that we've been hearing from the Republicans is any kind of uh, cutting activity between now and the election is basically a political gift to the Democrats. We know that Powell doesn't want to play that game, of course. Um, but do you think that that might temper the possibility of larger cuts or quicker cuts? Or do you think they can look through it and just survive whatever the criticism is in I the think, wake of their move? I mean, it's a great question. Um, you know, I'm very to, good at this. To borrow, to, to borrow from Austin Goolsby, I, I hope not. <laughs> I, <Right>. I think <laughs> not. <laughs> but, okay. um, you know, I, I don't think it's going to matter uh, one way or the other. I mean, you're sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, so if they don't go... W- and they do what they should do up front, then they'll have to do even more after the election. And that could ju- that could look even worse. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if it happens in September, they will have been on hold for 14 months, which is really long. It's not as if it would come out of the blue. If they wanted to bail they, out the incumbent, they would yeah. have already eased. Yeah. I mean, the idea that it's going to this election is going to hinge on 50 basis points is kind of wild anyway. Um, I mean, the market didn't seem to focus much or react much to uh, Trump's comments, which is kind of a reiteration of his stance that the president should have some kind of a say uh, in Fed policy, monetary policy. Is there a genuine Fed independence question in play? With if Trump, if Trump were elected, we'll let, yeah. we'll let you no, know in November. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think that um, I mean, it's this is him being it's him. Drama, I mean, I, yeah. I think that, you know, I mean, the, the, the president does have a say in monetary policy. I mean, yeah. uh, the uh, the Fed currently is Lisa Cook, Philip Jefferson, uh, yeah. Kugler. I mean, these are all Biden appointees. Right. So the president does have a say. You, it's based on the personnel that you put in there. So I think that was a fantastic take on our markets and about so many different topics. Let me know what you think down below in the comment section of that clip you just heard. Now, CNN's Fear and Greed Index still sits at 24, which is technically still in extreme fear until you get to 25 or higher. Market momentum is fear. Stock price strength is neutral. Stock price breadth is fear. Put and call options, extreme fear. Market volatility is neutral. Uh, Safe haven demand is extreme fear and junk bond demand is also an extreme fear. This is one of those signs or I guess indicators to say there could be more upside in markets, at least in the short term. Again, if the data comes in not as bad as feared this week, which the expectation is 
0.3% for retail sales. If you come in at 0.2, 0.1%, Wall Street's going to say at least it's not negative. That's positive. Okay. And I think you could get a, a, a potential move this week higher of almost 2% to this 50 day moving average. I would not be shocked at all if we're knocking on the doorstep of about 542, 543 for the SPY by Friday as long as retail sales come in good. I don't think we get there until Thursday. Um, so I really think Thursday you could get that outsized move potentially to the upside. Now, for the bears out there, you have rallied a lot in a very short amount of time. You have rallied from the 510 low. Technically, you were at about 507 in pre-market that, um, um, what was this, August 5th. You've already rallied about 4.5%. There could be some room to come down and retest that 100-day moving average as support again. You really want to watch the moving averages around here. If you hold support at the 100-day moving average, that's good. And you've seen that. On Thursday, you closed above the 100-day moving average, and you've seen support there on Friday, and then you just rallied, right? Um, gave some of it back, but you did end up closing positive almost a half of 1%. If we can start to move a little bit higher, then that 50-day moving average um, starts to look more in play. And I think just tactically in the short term, it, it really could go either way, but I am leaning more towards an upside move for this week. As you know... I'm in the hard landing camp as far as a, you know, percentage, right? I think there's a 60, 65 plus percent chance of a hard, harder landing. Uh, doesn't necessarily need to be a recession, but um, a lot more growth scare, right? A lot lower stock prices. So recession or not, I don't think matters. I think the economy will worsen and I think um, there will be more fears of a potential recession. And I mean, look at 2022, we had a, what, a almost 30% decline in the S&P, and we did not go into a technical recession. This was just when odds of a recession went to 100% over the next 12 months. That was in October, and markets were down from the high, um, let's see, roughly 27%. So to see something similar would not surprise me if the data um, continues to look bad. And that could mean, I mean, let's call it 30% from here, would put the SPY back to about 395. Is that possible? Yeah, sure, it's possible. That would put you back to basically the lows of 2023. That would be a 28% down move from here. Is that possible? Yeah. I mean, that's basically where we were um, less than a year ago or uh, right, right, right about a year ago, um, 10 months or so ago. So yeah, I mean, do you want to be super bullish here? Probably not. But in the very near term, I think there is room for an upside move. I think that same logic applies to Tesla. Tesla also has an upcoming catalyst on October 10th. So things are going to get really weird in markets. No matter what happens, Tesla's going to have this big catalyst. It's really hard to say what's going to happen between now and October 10th. Yes, you did fall 10% on the SPY, a technical correction from the high to the low. You've bounced up a little bit, about 4%. Tesla stock has bounced from the 180s to the 200s. Could you rally into October 10th? Yes, you could. Um, I think Wall Street's going to be pretty excited about the robo-taxi prospects at Tesla, especially if we get guidance for the robo-taxi it's a done deal at that point. Tesla stock's going a lot higher if we get that guidance. But between now and October 10th, you have a lot more data. Uh, and really, that data is going to dictate what happens to the markets. You have the Fed, uh, Jackson Hole just next week. You have the Fed meeting on September 18th. I mean, these are going to be huge catalysts. So between now and October 10th, I mean, where are markets going to be? And I'm not confident markets are going to be in a great place by October. I'm just going to be honest with you. And that will have a negative effect on Tesla. Now, if I'm wrong and markets are stable at, at, at best throughout now until October, which I think would be would be generous 
um, given, I mean, the Fed's going to be cutting rates, we still think 50 basis points. And that historically correlates to crashes in markets when the Fed starts to cut rates. Even Bank of America said last week, you still want to sell the first cut. I mean, that's not great timing for Tesla's event. It could be possible Tesla falls into that, of you know, falls from now until October 10th and then rallies after the event. It's very hard to say with any kind of certainty at all. In fact, impossible to say with any kind of certainty at all where Tesla will be by October 10th. But I do think for this week, there's a greater chance that we actually get an upside move of, like I said in the last video, potentially up to as high as 215 or so. I would be surprised if we break some of these longer term downtrending trend lines to the upside. I, I, I don't think the markets are going to be that bullish this week, um, but definitely a retest up to about 210 to 215, $10, move higher in Tesla would definitely be in play for this week. And that would be upside of about 5% on the low side and about 7.5% on the high side. Now, if retail sales comes in really good, Tesla could run a lot more than that, okay? And that would kind of change the dynamic of our market a bit. I don't think retail sales are going to come in really, really good. But again, if they do, then that's going to be the big catalyst in the near term to send markets and Tesla stock higher. So let me know what you think about all of this information down below in the comment section. Hit the like button as well as subscribe to the channel. Most importantly, enjoy the rest of your day and I will see you in the next one.